Okay, welcome back. So last time we talked about the birth of classicism, this incredible moment in the 5th century that sees the arrival of a truly rational, naturalistic form of art. And that this new form of art really only could have happened in ancient Greece. Only ancient Greece had the combination of rational philosophy that emphasized the observation of natural phenomenon and this love of sport and this love of exercise and the institutions, the social institutions, that would have given somebody the opportunity not just to exchange these ideas, but to see the body in motion. And these two things come together to create this revolution in naturalism that we call contraposto or classicism. Contraposto is the weight shift where the artist finally understands that the body is not just a collection of parts, but is a system that it has muscles and sinews and tendons that work in tandem that if one part is tensed another part must relax and it gives us this wonderful moment where we see a complete radical transformation in the art away from something that is stiff and lifeless to something that has this quality of life we also see a dramatic shift in tone that is due largely to innovations of poetry and theater that does more than just see these as subject matters, but sees them as people with their own internal lives. So we get this sense of pathos, this sense of feeling and emotion in these figures. All of this comes together to give us the first phase of classicism that we call the severe period or sometimes the transitional period. The reason we call it the severe period is because the faces are going to be very severe, very mask-like. They're not going to have the archaic smile, but they're going to have these stoic expressions. They're not going to be overtly emotional. The bodies are going to be very still, but it's a dynamic stillness. You'll see what I mean when we get into it, how they try to find the moment of the most intense potential energy of the body, the body just before movement occurs. And that the reason they do this is they want this to look as close to life as possible. The first phase of classicism happens from around the time period of the end of the Second Persian War up until about the middle of the 5th century. This is the time period of the Delian League. This is the alliance of all the Greek city-states to fight off the Persians. And it's also the time of the early Greek Empire under the Athenians. So we're going to take a look first at a place called Olympia. Olympia is a beautiful location deep here in the Peloponnesian uh, Peninsula. This is, of course, uh, the famed location of the Olympic Games. There you can see at the top uh, the famed stadium. And this is where they go to light the Olympic torch uh, even today for the Olympic Games. But it was also the location of a very famous, massive Doric temple. The Doric Temple has fallen down today, but if you look, you can see all of these discs. They look like discs. They're actually drums, and these are drums from the columns, and the columns are just enormous. Instead of carving these columns out of single blocks, single monolithic blocks of stone, they would instead carve them out of drums, and then the drums would be pinned to each other. So they each have like a socket on the inside that would align them. Sometimes they would carve the flutings before, but sometimes they would stack up the drums and carve the flutings afterwards. You can see these columns here haven't had the fluting carved in. You can see there's a little bit of fluting near the top, but they haven't carved it in. It's much easier to keep the fluting straight if you carve it after the drums are all stacked up. This gives you a sense of the scale of this temple. I somewhere in my closet in a shoebox have a picture of my sister at this site. Uh, many years ago we went and visited this site and my sister is reaching, my sister's only five foot two, but she's reaching up over her head and her hand still can't touch the other side of this uh, drum. So she's standing the drum. So the drums are, are well over six feet in diameter. This colossal columns all around the location. This was torn down by the Christians because it was a very important religious site, but in its prime it was just an incredible temple of enormous scale. Now it's most famous for being a site of one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, which was the Chris Elephantine statue of Zeus. This was by Phidias. Uh, a Chris Elephantine statue is a statue 
where the flesh is made out of pieces of ivory that have been pieced together, and then the clothing is made out of gold. Uh, this one is probably uh, uh, a pretty good reconstruction. Here is a smaller statue that is probably a copy of it, but there's a variety of kind of reconstructions. I love these two reconstructions because it gives you a sense of the scale of this thing. But that statue actually was created later in the classical period. The temple itself was made during the severe or transitional period, sometime around the year 460. And we're going to be taking a look at the west pediment. So the west pediment here is very similar to the pediment uh, at Aegina in that it has this kind of dynamic composition. You can see that we have figures that are laying down to fit the tight, narrow places. Others are crouching or fighting. And in the center, we have a god who's taller than everybody else. This is the story of the battle of the Lapiths and the Centaurs, which is this famous myths that comes from the region. Uh, the Lapith people uh, were having a celebrating a wedding, and so they invited all of the subjects of the kingdom to the wedding. And so you have in the very center uh, Apollo, the god, presiding, and his hand reaches out to one side. And the reason his hand reaches out to one side is because he's declaring his uh, allegiance in a fight that breaks out. In the midst of the wedding, uh, the centaurs, which are these half-horse, half-men that were invited to the wedding, get drunk, and they start to get a little frisky with the women. And so the men and the women start fighting back. This is the origin of the myth of how the centaurs uh, no longer exist. So if you were in ancient Greece and you said, how come there's no centaurs? Well, uh, because they got frisky at a wedding and the Lapith men slew them all. And so there are no more centaurs uh, because the centaurs were going to haul off the women and rape them because in Greek mythology, that's what centaurs do. They haul off women and they rape them. And you will never think of Dolores Umbridge in quite the same way again. Sorry for putting that into your mind, but there it is. So we see a, um, uh, Apollo presiding over this very raucous group. We have two centaurs fighting with women and two men trying to slay them in this group. When we look at the figure of Apollo, you can notice that he has this very severe facial expression. Doesn't seem too excited about the riot that's going on around him, but we have this idealized human form of the god Apollo. Uh, notice that the hair is tightly controlled, but each lock is a little different. They recognize that locks are going to fall differently. The anatomy is very accurate. I particularly love the anatomy of the arm and the abdomen. As we go to the individual figures, as we look to this grouping on uh, the left of Apollo, uh, his right, our left, uh, we can see a woman that is fighting with a centaur. The centaur has grabbed her around her middle and she is delivering an elbow to the centaur's head, uh, yet she manages to look quite calm. This face is restored and partially uh, modern, but it's pretty accurate of what it would have been looked like. So at this time, even though we have this moment of action, there's still a great deal of calm and reserve going on here. But we're seeing a moment of pent up uh, kind of action about to just kind of break free. On the other side, uh, we have a very famous chariot race uh, that was known in the region. This one's from the East Pediment. Again, uh, Apollo presides. He's standing taller uh, than everyone else. And the two contestants are there to either side of him with their chariot races. And then everyone else is kneeling or sitting. Uh, this one's a lot more controlled composition. There's not as much action figures are waiting to go to the chariot race. The action isn't happening, it's about to happen. We still have a, a few kind of interesting dynamic gestures. We have this seer, and here the seer holds his hand to his cheek. His mouth is open. Notice that even though he has all these tight curls on his head, each one is individually carved. Uh, seers are older people, so this is one of the few cases where you'd allow somebody to have a dad bod. Uh, and look a little bit uh, more middle-aged. But look at the drapery comes over his uh, lap, and also look how he looks to the chariot race with uh, great apprehension. Uh, it gives the portent of this race and what it means to uh, the myth at the time. 
and how he holds the hand uh, to his cheek. Well, now we're going to go back to Delphi. So remember Delphi? Delphi is this location where the Oracle of Delphi is, and there's many uh, foundations, many kind of treasuries or dedications or votive objects that are given to the god. And there is one that was created during this severe period, the very famous charioteer of Delphi. Now this was found intentionally buried in the fourth and again in the fifth century when Christians took over the region, they knocked down all the pagan temples. And it appears that whoever buried this, buried this to prevent it from being destroyed and melted down by Christians. And so it was buried on the location. Uh, we can tell by his dress, uh, his uh, long uh, kiton, and the fact that his girdle is tied behind his back. You can see how it's bound his sleeves back. Uh, and the fact that he's holding reins is that he was meant to be a charioteer. And he probably was part of a larger group known as a quadriga. A quadriga is a four-horsed uh, chariot. Um, he's a little bit tall, a little bit long in leg. You may notice that uh, his proportions are a bit off. Uh, so we talk about this era as an era that is increasingly concerned with proportions, uh, but this guy has legs that go on for days. That's probably because, again, he was standing in a chariot, and the chariot itself was probably up on a large stone plinth, which means people were looking up at it. So there's a little bit of forced perspective at work here. Uh, if he was, you know, normal proportioned, his head would be a doubt here, and he'd be very difficult to see. You put all, put all this money into the charioteer, you definitely want people to see him. So he's been stretched a little bit. But it's only a, a small modification. Notice how elegant the drapery is, how uh, even though he's been tied back with his girdle, how it slips over his lap. Uh, and you can particularly see this detail of the concern is when you get to his face. This is one of the few bronze statues that survive from the time period that actually has the inlaid eyes still intact. Again, they were trying to capture the quality of life. And so they put inlaid eyes, they would paint these statues, and notice that they've even put in eyelashes. That's how um, absolutely scrupulous they were to detail. I love the locks coming off his sideburns. You can see how each one is individually uh, formed. Uh, each lock is individually formed to make it unique and organic the way that a human being really would be. His lips are slightly parted the way most people's lips are when you are just kind of standing there. You don't sit there with your mouth rigidly closed all the time. So all of this is meant to give a sense of life into the figure. The figure is standing still, but the quality is to give you the idea that you've just caught him standing still for a moment, that at any moment he could suddenly spring to life. We'll see that more in other statues from this transitional time period. Well, we're going to go to a large peninsula above Attica, uh, Eubea, and right here in a tiny little bay on the south of this peninsula, you have um, the Cape of Artemisian. And this was where a shipwreck was discovered. In case you haven't figured it out, shipwrecks are going to be very, very important uh, in the study of art because so few objects survive. Greeks tended to make things out of bronze. The sculpture tended to be made out of bronze, but bronze was very expensive. And when you add up thousands of years since the time these things were created, there's more chances for these things to be taken and melted down. There's a story told about a beautiful cult statue, a magnificent cult statue to Apollo that was found on the island of Crete, but it was found in the middle of the Greek war for independence against the Ottomans. So they took the statue and they melted it down and turned it into a cannon. Ugh, it's just terrible. Uh, so few cult statues survive. So shipwrecks are important because shipwrecks are locations where things have been preserved. And a lot of these bronze statues were loaded onto ships that were going to be taking them to be recycled or sold off. And these ships sunk in storms. And so bronze statues wind up being preserved. So a number of bronze statues and items got found at this shipwreck in, back in 1926. And probably the most famous of them is this one. This was known as the God of the Sea or as Poseidon. 
Uh, it's a very romantic idea because it came out of the sea. That's their assumption uh, that they called it. But in reality, it's probably Zeus. The reason we think it's Zeus is that because rarely do we see Poseidon throwing uh, a trident as you know he would a javelin. But we do see Zeus throwing thunderbolts. In fact, we have little figurines where he throws thunderbolts. And you can see him throwing thunderbolt with his arm stretched out in front of him. The statue is really remarkable. It's slightly larger than life size. Again, uh, it's a masterwork of anatomy. You can see the triceps are taut because his arm is extended. You can see very subtly the serratus anterior, uh, interstitial muscles underneath his uh, arm. Uh, you can see the Adonis belt, uh, the obliques. Greeks really loved obliques. Uh, we seem to be really crazy about six packs right now, but Greeks loved obliques. That's what they were into, so we call this deep V on the oblique, the Adonis belt. Uh, it was considered a, a very beautiful feature. They also liked very thick thighs and uh, very thick uh, glutes, uh, as you can see in this reverse image. So it's a marvel of anatomy, but I think one of the things that's the best about it is it captures this concept of dynamic stillness. When I say dynamic stillness, that really sounds like an oxymoron. It sounds like, how can something be dynamic and yet still? If you ever thrown a ball in the air uh, to catch it again, you'll notice that there's a moment where the ball at the top of its arc is perfectly still. It lasts for less than a fraction of a second, but it stops before it comes down. That's when it has the most potential energy, and then it comes down. The same thing is true in the body of an athlete. If you've ever seen an athlete throw a javelin or a ball or anything, they have a wind-up and then they swing. If you've ever seen a batter swing, if you've ever seen a golfer swing, they pull that club or that bat all the way back, and at the full pullback of that swing, they actually stop. And then, boom, motion happens. It's the same thing when throwing a javelin. When you throw a javelin, you put all of your weight um, on your back foot to start, but then as you begin to th move forward, you put all of your weight onto your front foot, and you'll notice that as you do this, the back foot pops up, the heel pops up. And so this is the moment just before he throws this javelin. This is the moment where he has paused, he is aiming, and then he's gonna throw the javelin. And a lot of these sculptures out of the severe period really capture this moment, the moment of stillness just before action, the moment where the most potential energy is located in the body. Now, first of all, they actually would go to the gymnasium and watch people exercise so they could actually see this in action and motion. But I think the reason they chose this moment is it's the best moment to choose if you're gonna make a statue because statues don't move. If you're trying to make a statue look lifelike, um, you have to try and capture a moment where the person is on the verge of moving, but still not quite actually moving. And so the goal was to, to try and find something that looked right at the moment of movement. And so it makes these things much more lifelike, much more powerful in their execution, because it makes you feel as if they could spring to life at any moment. I think that's what they were really trying to capture. They were trying to capture that stillness just before action. When we look at this figure, again, his eyes are missing, but his eyes would have been inlaid. Uh, in fact, his lips, his eyebrows, and his nipples are all inlaid with copper, because those things are different colors, and so they wanted them to have a different color. I love how the beard um, is still pretty tightly controlled. Whatever beard product or oil he's using, it's very good, uh, but each curl is unique. You know, gone is the heavily patterned hair. Instead, we have little curls that have their own unique character that curl in an, uh, a kind of more believable fashion. All of this is, again, trying to capture uh, the quality of life. Uh, moving to Italy and going back to Magna Graecia, uh, which is Sicilia, um, or Sicily, and uh, Calabria, the, the toe and the football of Italy, uh, we have another location that we're going to look at. 
uh, Riace. And Riace is a small little community, but it was a Greek uh, seaport uh, right in the toe of Italy. And right off the coast, there was another one of these marvelous shipwrecks. And in this shipwreck, they discovered the so-called Riace bronzes or Riace warriors. Uh, when these were discovered back in 1972, I think the legend is somebody saw a hand sticking out of the sand uh, when they went diving and they thought uh, this was a, a victim of a, of a mafia killing uh, because this was Italy. Uh, but they went down there and discovered it wasn't a body, uh, that they were in fact uh, two amazing bronze statues. So again, the importance of finds coming out of the ocean is very, very important. When we look at these figures, they have many of the same qualities that we see from figures from the Severe period. They have this beautiful contrapposto, uh, and they have this kind of elegant, dynamic stancing. Also, they have the preserved enamel in the eyes, and they have this wonderful, very detailed, but also very loosely, uh, you know, and uh, independently coiled hair, where each curl is unique. When we look at this figure, you can see the bulge of a vein in the forearm. Uh, you can see the serratus anterior muscles. Again, the Adonis belt. This, they, they were crazy about the Adonis belt. They were as crazy about the Adonis belt uh, as people are today about the six-pack. Every age has the thing that they were crazy about. He was uh, a warrior that probably would have been holding a spear in one hand and a shield in the other, but the shield and the spear are now gone. This is Warrior A. And this is Warrior B, who also would have been holding a shield. He is missing one of the original eyes. And also he had a separate piece that would have been a helmet that would have been a Corinthian helmet sitting on his uh, head, uh, but is now since gone. These figures also had, in addition to inlaid eyes, they had inlaid nipples and lips. You can see that the lips are inlaid in copper and the nipples are inlaid in copper to give them a different color because again, that's true to human beings and they want those to be accurate. Now, an interesting debate has emerged about these two statues. When they were first discovered, people said because of their posture, because of their, their contrapposto, uh, their reserved faces, the detailing, that they fit well into this severe period, this time period where we're transitioning into the classical period. But a new evaluation has come about in the in last 20 years or so well, actually more like last 30 years or so. I keep forgetting how old I am. And people started noticing that uh, the groove in his back is a little bit too deep. Some of the muscles are puckered a little bit too much. This tricep, this muscle around here, uh, this is a bit too extreme. His hips are a little bit too far to the side. The veins are bulging just a little bit too much. The figure is more than just uh, you know, a classical figure. He's a little bit of exaggerated. And so an interesting theory developed, uh, which I like to mention because it's important to realize that a lot of these dates that we come up with these things are based on style. And the theory says that these are not from the fifth century, that they're actually from the second century and that they are Hellenistic works of art. Hellenistic works of art are known for exaggerating certain details of the anatomy. They're more amped up, they're more pumped up as if they're on uh, steroids. You'll see when we get to Hellenistic art. And so people are saying these are not classical severe periods uh, pieces. These are Hellenistic periods that are intentionally anachronistic. Uh, and so this shows that style is very, very fluid. It changes dramatically over time. Uh, I have lived long enough to see bell bottoms come back at least three times now. I lived through the original bell bottoms when I was a kid and I never thought they would ever come back and sure enough they came back in the 90s and then they came back again. So you know there's no accounting for taste or style uh, and then you have to ask the question you know is this original or is it vintage or is it retro? Uh, you know I, I gave my daughter my acid watch my acid washed uh, blue jeans Levi uh, jacket, denim jacket, and uh, everybody thought that she had bought it new, uh, that she had bought it. She said, "No, this is original. This isn't. This is this is vintage. This isn't. Uh, this isn't retro. This is genuine vintage." Well, those kind of 
changes in taste happen in, happen in the ancient world too, all the time. And so it's very hard to tell. Are these statues from the initial foray into classicism? Or are these statues from somebody a couple centuries later looking nostalgically back on that time period and creating them intentionally in an archaic style? Well, not an archaic style, but anachronistic style. Uh, and that's something I just can't answer. Uh, and many people can't answer. It's uh, always hard when styles change. They have comebacks. They, had re they have revivals. And so unless you're very, very certain of the date of things, you can't quite be certain. We'll see a lot of revivals of classism as we go on in the class. And so this might, this might be evidence of an early revival of this incredible moment. Just two centuries later, they were already nostalgic for this moment of uh, the arrival of classicism. Well, anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, we're going to shift gears here and start talking about the Western Mediterranean. So while this transformation, this magical transformation was happening in Greece, and this development from the Archaic into the Classical period was happening in Greece, something else was happening in the Western Mediterranean at the same time, in Italy. And so in Italy, particularly in the central and northern sections of Italy, we have a completely different group of people. So remember that down here in southern Italy, this part had been colonized by Greeks, but we have another group of people here in northern and central Italy, and we call those people Italic peoples. Uh, and here's where I make the dad joke. No, that doesn't mean they all lean to one side. No, it just means that these were the original uh, people from Italy. And they have several different names and several different cultures. They aren't all unified. They're very much tribal cultures with their own identity. But we're going to talk about a couple of different groups. We're going to talk about the Villanovans, the Villanovans uh, are first discovered in a region known as Villanova, uh, which is near modern-day Bologna, but uh, we call them Villanova because that's where their artifacts were first found. And they seem to move into this area. They are definitely Indo-European peoples, and they move in right around the collapse of the Bronze Age. Some people actually say that they are remnants of the Sea Peoples who came into this area. If you read the Aeneid, by uh, Virgil, the great Roman poet, and the Aeneid is the great epic poem of Rome, that tells the story of Aeneas. Aeneas is a person who flees the destruction of Troy and ends up establishing uh, a new nation on the Italian peninsula. So maybe there's some kernel of truth to this idea that these people from the Bronze Age came uh, and settled here. We then have another group of people that come in, and they come in a few centuries later, and we call these group of people the Etruscans, and they dominate this central uh, section of Italy. And we call it Tuscany today, because Etruscan, Tuscany, they're related. Uh, and they come into this area and they have a completely different material culture. And we don't know, are they a native population that just kind of evolved naturally uh, out of the surrounding populations, or are they immigrants to the area? Did they you know, conquer this territory. We'll have more to say about them. So these people live roughly during the same kind of time period. There's our overlays of our stylistic periods, geometric, orientalizing, archaic, and classical. And the Villanovan and Italic tribes are developing around the same time that the first independent Greek city-states are developing. One of these tribes we will come back and talk about later. Uh, these tribes are the Latins, and the Latins ultimately become the people that we call the Romans. Uh, Rome, according to tradition, is founded in the middle of the 8th century. And then the Etruscans come in, and here's the most important part. Rome is actually conquered and ruled by Etruscans for uh, about 200 years. And so for about 200 years there, Rome is ruled by Etruscans. So that's why we study the Etruscans, because a, a lot of Roman culture is actually not Roman culture, it is Etruscan culture. And a lot of Rome was actually not built by Romans, it was built by Etruscans. There's an old joke, uh, if you're a classicist, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, Rome wasn't built in a day. Uh, but if you're a classicist and you study the classics, you'll say Rome wasn't built in a day and it wasn't built by the Romans either. It was built by the Etruscans. Uh, eventually, the Romans will overthrow the Etruscans and establish a new government we call a republic, but we'll talk about that when we get to the Romans. So let's get back to Villanovan culture. 
So there was a tiny little settlement called Villanova. It's near modern-day Bologna, and this is where we first started to find their artifacts. But you can see that their artifacts are all over Italy. Some of them actually get down here into Campania. This is the region of Rome. Um, but they're mostly on the coast here. And you can see their little, um, you know, culture as it developed. One of the things that's characteristic about their culture is the Villanovan hut urn. Villanovan hut urns are really simple ceramic uh, urns that are designed to hold the ashes of the dead. They practice cremation, so their dead would be burned, and then the ashes and the bone fragments would be gathered and placed into this urn, and this urn would then be buried. It's called a hut urn because it's patterned after huts. In fact, if you've ever seen a, you know, a Villanovan hut, uh, it probably looked very similar to this urn. And we know what these huts look like, not just because we have the urns, but because we also have the foundations to some of these huts. They would carve the foundations of these huts right into the living rock. In fact, there's a very famous foundation carved into the Palatine Hill. This is the hill that where Rome was founded, and this is believed to be the hut of Romulus, the founder of Rome. So it seems that, you know, if, if you date Rome to the beginning of the, uh, you know, the 8th century, somewhere in that area, then maybe there's a kernel of truth here. Maybe this really was Romulus's hut. And if so, then maybe the Romans were the descendants of these Villanovan peoples, or were at least very culturally similar. Uh, they eventually move on to more complex urns, and we see a variety of urns. These urns have a handle to tip them with, and they often have a lid. I love this lid because this lid also functions as a scoop. You can pour things out into it and measure things. You can see that it has its own flat base as well, so it too can function as a, as a bowl or a scoop. It's very functional. But in this case, it's functioning as a lid. They would put the ashes of the person inside. And so this is a functional piece of pottery that was made uh, and interpreted and reinterpreted and specifically to be an urn. What I love is sometimes you will see these urns, but they'll actually have a helmet on top of them. Uh, there are these bronze helmets that are very, very uh, idiosyncratic to the Villanovan people. And so this is an indication that this was uh, a burial. These are the ashes of a warrior, uh, somebody of high status. And sometimes we actually see lids to these things that aren't helmets. This one's an actual helmet. This was probably the helmet of the deceased being used as the lid for his own urn. But sometimes we see uh, a lid made out of ceramic that's made to look like a helmet. So, you know, it became a kind of uh, an interesting statement. Well, from very humble beginnings, we then move to the Etruscans. And the Etruscans arrive sometime around the year 800 in central Italy, and they quickly establish control over the entire area. And eventually you can see that they expand their influence uh, to the north and far down into the south, including this area known as Campania, uh, which includes the Latins and Rome. Uh, and they have a total shift in material culture. So once the Etruscans come in, people abandon the hut urns, they abandon those pots um, where they're burying things, they stop making those oval huts, and they start making architecture out of mud brick and wood that looks much more like what we see Greeks make. And this has always begged a question. Does this mean that we have a new culture coming in? Did a new group of people invade Italy and conquer this territory somewhere around the year 800? Or did we just have a group of elites move in and, you know, did they say, hey, you know, here's how we make houses, here's how we make pots, and everybody said, ooh, that's cool, and they started changing their culture to the new group of elites that moved in. We don't know. There doesn't seem to be much evidence of conquest. There's no burned cities or anything like that. Nothing like what we see at the end of the Bronze Age and the Aegean. So I think that either the Etruscans evolved from the local population, maybe they were trading with Greeks, maybe they adopted a lot of the Greek ideas. There's a lot of evidence that they were trading with Greeks in Magna Graecia in southern Italy, and maybe they just adopted or changed their ideas. Or maybe they were a group of Greeks or similar peoples who moved into the territory and brought those ideas with them. We don't really know. Uh, but they're definitely the first rulers of Rome. They conquer Rome, and so a lot of Etruscan culture winds up, up, ends up there. Uh, Etruscans do have writing. They have their own writing system. You can see it, and you can tell how dramatic the shift in culture is because we do not have artifacts like this 
from earlier Italic peoples. These are the very famous Pyrgi plates or Pyrgi tablets. Uh, this was a dedicatory inscription made on gold plates. And then you can tell that those gold plates were then riveted or sealed at the corners. And these three gold plates were riveted and sealed together and they were buried under the foundation of a temple. And the temple is dedicated to a goddess uh, that is described as Uni in one inscription and as Astaroth or Astarte in the other. And it's actually written in two languages. One of the plates is written in Phoenician, which is a Semitic language from the Eastern Mediterranean. And this one is written in Etruscan, which is an Indo-European language. That's really bizarre. So there's two different language groups, two different ethnic groups represented here. Does this mean that the Etruscans the Etruscans are Indo-European, Etruscans an Indo-European language, um, but does this mean that they had extensive trade with uh, Phoenicians who are people of the Levant and the Eastern Mediterranean? Probably so. So obviously it was important enough to this person to write it in both Phoenician and Etruscan, so that shows that maybe the Etruscans are coming from some other place and have strong contacts. There's a lot of things that indicate that. One of the things that's very interesting about the Etruscans is they have a large funeral cult. Um, it was very important to them to take care of their dead, whereas the earlier Italic peoples certainly cared for their dead and made urns and other things for the dead. Uh, the Etruscans built huge necropoli. A necropolis is a city of the dead. And these were tombs and family tombs that they would bring their dead to. So these are obviously some kind of ancestor worship. These are not tombs that you make as a one-off and then drop off grandma or grandpa and then never see her again and maybe bring flowers on uh, some important occasion. You would return to these regularly uh, for as places of worship. That strongly indicates that there's some kind of ancestor worship, that you had to preserve your ancestors or provide for them in the afterlife. So very similar to what the Egyptians thought. And all of the tombs are very rich. Many of them are very richly decorated. There's a large body of wall paintings. In fact, the largest body or corpus of archaic period wall paintings we have from this time period. When you consider we have so few paintings from the archaic period in the Greek, uh, this is really important. And they're also just loaded with grave goods. Um, you can see in these pictures that we have the, a variety of tomb types. Some are, are tombs that are built into these long rectangular structures. The most common, however, is going to be the tumulus. A tumulus is a mound of earth. In this case, the mound of earth usually has a low retaining wall, earth over it, and then it has an interior passageway that goes into a burial chamber. And this passageway would be sealed up from time to time, uh, but also you would continue to come back to these tombs to honor the dead. Uh, the Regolini Galassi tomb is one of the earliest of these tombs, and this tomb comes from what would have been the Orientalizing period uh, in Greece. And here you see that it has a long passage, and the very tail end uh, worked as a burial chamber, but it also has two burial chambers off to the side. All of this was under a, a large conical section of earth. Uh, the burial chambers are made out of blocks of tufa, uh, these are big blocks of volcanic rock that are relatively easy to cut. It's relatively soft stone, but it's very structurally sound. And you can see that the lower parts are carved right into the bedrock itself, into the passage. So the burial chamber this way, burial chamber this way, and a burial chamber there. Here's a reconstruction of it. And at the tail end, they found a body. The body was draped, uh, and it was just covered in a lavish grave goods. There were gold and silver artifacts, bowls and vessels. The body had a massive breastplate of gold. This is a pectoral. Uh, this is a not a, a functional breastplate for like war. This is a breastplate for decoration. And you can see that it has these incredibly detailed engravings. Also on the body was the golden fibula. We'll talk about that in a minute. And there was a large amount of grave goods. This is an ivory pyxis. An ivory pyxis is a box carved out of a tusk. You can see that it's like a section of a, of a uh, elephant tusk. And if you look at it, we have sphinxes. And we have griffin-like figures. These are characters from Near Eastern mythology. 
So this looks like what we call a Syro-Palestinian uh, motif. Syro-Palestinians are things coming out of the Levant, out of Syria, Lebanon, modern-day Israel, Palestine. We also have these golden circlets. Had a couple of these. So these are armbands, these beautiful chunks of jewelry. And you can see that the armbands have geometric decoration, but we also have a series of figures. And the figures, again, look like things we see from the ancient Near East. There was a bronze bed uh, made out of woven bands of bronze. Uh, this is very elaborate bed. Uh, again, beds were probably, you know, maybe the frame was made out of wood or, or bronze, but the interior part would have been made out of cloth or leather or something like that. So this has been made out of bronze to show how high status it is, so that it will last for the deceased. Uh, and then we also find cauldrons. One of those orientalizing cauldrons uh, that we've talked about so much, we find those. So these things may have been Greek artifacts. Some of these objects are clearly locally made, but some of them are clearly imports coming all the way from Syria and the Eastern Mediterranean. And so this is probably a, an import coming out of Greece. So this shows that they have far ranging trade contacts. But this object is unique and was probably made locally. This is the great golden fibula. A fibula is just a big fancy safety pin. That's all it is. Uh, if you have a cloak, the cloak is a rectangular cloak. You need to pin the cloak. Uh, so you need a big fancy pin. So this is a big fancy brooch uh, that would pin your cloak on your shoulder. And the thing is bigger than a dinner plate. Uh, you know, you can see earlier picture exactly how big this thing is. It's enormous. Uh, you can't even hardly imagine wearing something this size on your shoulder, uh, but there it is. And it's incredibly ornate. So the upper part has a series of floral motifs, and in the center it has five lions. Then at the clasp, at the hinge, you have a series of gold chevron patterns that are so tiny you can hardly see them. Then this lower section here, which I have a detail here, is actually made up of little golden birds. And in between the birds are images of griffins. This is something that you can't hardly see, but when you look at details, every, every single inch of this is lined in what we call granulation. Granulation uses little tiny grains of gold. And these grains of gold are individually uh, soldered on. So they would make these little tiny balls of gold, and then they would have to solder on each individual ball. Um, just look at all of those those granules! My gosh, the, the, the man hours going into that to get that detailing. It's just incredible. So whoever lived here, obviously a very high status individual. We also find much less fancy tombs. Uh, we find canopic urns. We call these canopic urns, but they're not like canopic urns in Egypt. They're meant to hold organs. These are meant to hold the ashes, and they come in a variety of forms. Uh, they are anthropomorphic. That means that they look like humans, vaguely. I love this. This is a, a vase, and you can see how it has these sharp shoulders and stylized arms. It has this very abstract kind of oblong head. Uh, as we go on later in time, uh, you go a century later, and the face gets a little bit more naturalistic. It starts to look more like archaic art from the Greek world. Hands look a little more naturalistic. Again, this would have been a vase that held the ashes, so the reason you put a face on it is the face represents the deceased. So we see that they move from an abstract style to a style that's probably being influenced very much by Greece. Well, one of the major burial sites is going to be Tarquinia. Uh, Tarquinia is the... Um, a major necropolis. And here is a view of the necropolis. Again, not much to look at from the air, but we have these tombs. These tombs are cut right into the tufa, uh, the living rock or the limestone, as it may be. And they're covered in just beautiful frescoes or wall paintings. This one is called the Tomb of the Leopards because it has two leopards in the upper registers. Again, archaeologists they're not known for their imagination, but there you go. And But you can see other details. For one, the roof is painted as if it's a tent. So this is probably meant to represent a pavilion. 
Uh, so the deceased would die, a pavilion would set up, there would be a feast. And so this is a representation of a feast for and behalf of the deceased, but it's also a representation of the banquet that the deceased would enjoy into the afterlife. So you can see that in the lower registers, we have people enjoying a banquet. Off to the one side, every banquet has to have cup bearers who are bringing you your, your drinks. Uh, you also have to have musicians who can play the lyre and the double flute. Uh, when we look at these figures, they're very dynamic. They have these wonderful sweeping uh, you know, cloaks that they're wearing. And then in between them are these lively little trees. The banquet scene, I think, is the most interesting. When we look at the banquet scene, it looks very much like a Greek symposia. I remember, Greek symposia are kind of dinner parties, uh, but they were male only. If you'll notice here, lying on these beautiful couches, which do look like Greek couches, you see not just a men, but women. So the convention here, just as it was in the ancient world or in Egypt, is that women are shown with pale skin because they work indoors and, you know, therefore they are indoor oriented. And the men are shown as dark skinned because they're supposed to work outside. They're warriors, farmers, workers, things like that. And so the men and women are lying together on the couch, enjoying a repast while servants uh, bring them their cups and entertain them. And it's amazing how sometimes how, how tender and remarkable it is. Uh, this woman reaches over here to her man, her spouse. He reaches into a bowl and plucks some food and he's going to feed it to her. Uh, that's a very kind of romantic uh, notion. And it shows that the status of women in Etruscan society is a lot higher than the status of women in Greek society. This is an interesting wrinkle. In fact, we know from written sources that Etruscan women uh, could have professions. They could own property. Uh, they had property rights and rights to dowries. And if uh, their husband died, they inherited their property and could still run their property. Just think of the Odyssey. In the story of the Odyssey, uh, you have Penelope, uh, Odysseus's long-suffering wife, and the only way she could hold on to her property uh, was to entertain all these suitors. But once she got married, she would have to surrender all of that property over to her new husband, which is why she was holding out so long that Odysseus would come back because she really didn't want to hand over her property uh, to someone else. But that wasn't true in the Etruscan world. In the Etruscan world, women had status. And so as a view of the afterlife, this is kind of a nice view of the afterlife, that you and your beloved uh, wife could enjoy an endless repast. And this isn't accidental. We see this everywhere. Uh, there's a nearby temple, the Temple of Poggio Civitate. And at the P Temple of uh, Poggio Civitate, we have these beautiful terracotta roof elements. These are called acroteria or cornices or protomes. But there's also a terracotta frieze. And on the terracotta frieze, we see a banqueting scene. This is a little hard to see in the tile, but in the drawing, you can see how, again, we have mixed groups. We have men and women lying on uh, couches uh, with tables of food in front of them, enjoying their, uh, their repast. Uh, it looks like a happy view of the afterlife, much happier than the Greek view of the afterlife, at least. And that isn't all. We have these beautiful sarcophagi. This is known as the sarcophagus of the spouses or the banqueting couple. Uh, and here again, we have a loving couple. Uh, she lies in his arms. He holds a plate. The plate is unfortunately now missing. And they pluck food and they're feeding each other. Uh, so they lay on a couch and enjoy a banquet into the repast. Uh, they enjoy this repast into the afterlife. Uh, notice that their faces are very mask-like and they have the archaic smiles. So stylistically, with their patterned hair, this is very similar to archaic Greek art. The subject and the content is unique to the Etruscan world, but it's clear that they're being inspired by the Greeks, at least stylistically, with the patterned hair. One thing that you'll notice about the Etruscans is there's not a lot of stone sculpture. There's not a lot of bronze sculpture. Most of this is going to be in wood or terracotta. Uh, their temples are going to be made out of wood and brick and terracotta and not be made out of stone the way the Greeks were, uh, even though they were a very strong localized, uh, you know, kingdom and empire. Uh, they tend to have uh, less permanent materials, shall we say. 
So the banqueting theme is a common theme of these tombs, but the tombs also show people just enjoying life. Uh, here in the tomb of hunting and fishing, we have scenes of people hunting and fishing. Again, our historians and archaeologists not known for their imagination. Uh, at the top, we see what appears to be people preparing for a funeral banquet. Notice that they are making garlands of flowers, and they're hanging those garlands up. So this is in preparation of the funerary banquet itself. You'll see that those garlands are hanging there. But down below, we have a scene of people hunting. This person is using a sling to hunt birds. These people are fishing off the edge of the prow of a ship. Elsewhere on the wall, we have somebody diving, uh, taking a swim. When we look at the birds, the birds stylistically look a little bit like Egyptian art. Uh, and what I love is that there is two tiers to the understanding of this piece. For one, you see the scene on the wall, but you also have garlands hanging. Garlands are what you do in a funerary, uh, funeral context. So these are this is a funerary motif. And I don't think we're supposed to understand this as people are swimming while the funeral is going on. I think what we're supposed to understand is that this is the interior of a house. Uh, this is a dwelling. And so this is probably representative of what houses were like, that houses had interior frescoes that were just there as decoration, much as we saw in the Minoan and the Mycenaean world. And what we're supposed to imagine is that this is a house in mourning, and these are the kind of paintings we would see on an, an everyday house, but this house is in mourning, and so we have garlands uh, to celebrate the dead. Etruscan buildings, we do not have a lot of Etruscan buildings, uh, because again, they tended to build in brick and wood, and those don't survive as well as the stone buildings. But Etruscan temples are unique. For one, they do not have a colonnade that goes all the way around. Greeks really loved to have this symmetry where they were they look identical from the back as they do the front. They have a porch that goes all the way around. They have stairs that go all the way around that you can get up to. And Etruscan temples do not have that. Instead, Etruscan temples are very frontally focused. There is a podium. Uh, the entire temple is on a raised podium. You can only access that podium from stairs at the front and not from any side. Uh, if you go around to the back, there's no way to get into the back. There's no porch. There's nothing there. Instead, you have a deep porch on the front and very broad eaves. When you get to the interior of the temple, that front porch doesn't lead you into a single cella or naos. It leads you into a triple naos or cella uh, with three separate doors. And this was because of the uniqueness of Etruscan religion. Etruscan deities, a lot like Celtic or other Indo-European deities, were often worshipped as triads. That is, you had three gods that were closely related to each other, and in some way were somehow the same god in three different aspects. There were many triads in the Indo-European and Celtic worlds. If you're familiar with the Morrigans, uh, the, the Morrigan sisters in Irish uh, mythology, there were lots of these different triads that existed. But the Etruscans had their own as well. And the most important triad is what we call the Capitoline Triad, because these were worshipped on the Capitoline Hill in Rome. And the Capitoline Triad um, are going to be uh, Jupiter, or Jove, um, which is roughly analogous to Zeus, but again, not quite. Juno, who is roughly analogous to Hera in the Greek tradition, but again, not. And Minerva, who is again, roughly analogous to um, uh, Athena, but not the same. We often hear that the Greek gods and the Roman gods are the same, they're just different names. That's not quite true. The truth is that Greek gods and Roman gods are quite different. There are different stories told about them. But the Greeks were so influential that the Romans just kind of combined their gods together. We call this syncretism. You know, if we have a sky god that shoots thunder and you have a sky god that shoots thunder, even though we may have different stories and different aspects about them, we're going to say, well, that's probably the same god, and we're going to fuse those two stories and traditions together. So the Etruscans actually had their own gods. So, you know, Jove, Juno, and Minerva are going to be one of these very important triads that we'll see. So we actually have a few uh, remnants of these temples. Here at the site of Ve, uh, there is a temple. And what I love is that the only thing that's left of it is the tufa foundation. Uh, so blocks of tufa to make the foundation. The upper part has completely disintegrated, but the, um, 
the, the local um, uh, preservation uh, team has put this uh, wireframe here to give you a sense of how big the temple was and how impressive these temples would have been. This temple also would have had a triple cella, uh, also would have had a very deep porch and a front, uh, you know, proneos, but no uh, opposthitimus or back porch on the other side. They're very frontally organized. And this thing um, had a large number of figures on the roof. Uh, we call these figures acroteria or ridgepole figures. Now, if this were Greece, they'd be putting the decoration up here in the pediment. But in Etruria, in Tuscany, the decorations are going to go on the roof. As we look to one of these cornice areas here, we're going to see beautiful terracotta cornices in multiple colors with heads and acanthus leaves and Greek keys. Really beautiful. When we look to the ridgepole figures, we're going to be seeing a story out of the third labor of Hercules. So this is a Greek myth. So this shows evidence that they're being influenced by Greek myth. In this story, Heracles has to go kill this magical uh, deer, this hind with golden horns. Here you can see Hercules, his head and arms are missing, but here you can see standing on the deer. Uh, the deer is trussed up and he's going to remove the horns. This deer was sacred to Artemis, and so Artemis was not happy about uh, Hercules or Heracles doing this, so she sends her big brother, her twin brother, Apollo, to go uh, interrupt this scene. So here we have Heracles, and here we have Apollo. Both of these figures are made, again, out of terracotta. You can see that they are hollow, constructed. It's really kind of a marvel that you can make these larger than life-size sculptures out of terracotta. It's very, very hard material to, to work in that scale, and then you got to fire it. you got to have a kiln big, big enough to fire it. When we look at it, um, that's also why it has to have this elaborate kind of construction between his legs uh, to give him support. But we see him striding forward, but notice that he has the heavily patterned hair. Here's a detail. He has a very heavily patterned hair. His drapery is very heavily patterned, and he has, of course, uh, the archaic smile. So this shows that even as they are moving into this time period, they are influenced by the Greeks. Now notice the date. This is around the time that the Greeks are starting to abandon the archaic smile and develop. Uh, and the Etruscans don't quite get there. They, they are obviously being influenced by the Greeks, and they will get there eventually, but not till a much later date. So the high point of Etruscan civilization is analogous to the Archaic period. The Greeks peak later. Their high point is going to be classical civilization, but the Etruscans actually peak earlier. And by the time we get um, into the 5th century, uh, their influence is going to be waning, and they're actually going to be more dominated by the growing power that is going to be Rome down here. But a couple of other things we want to talk about. First, we want to talk about Perugia. So at the city of Perugia, there is a massive city gate that was built by the Etruscans. Um, this upper part here was finished off in the medieval and the Renaissance eras, so ignore it. But everything else below was actually built in the Etruscan period. And it's one of the first examples of a true arch that we've seen up until this point. Now the arch is a long and slow development. Remember we had the post and lintel that has one horizontal member and two vertical members. Post and lintel is very simple, but it's limited in that this lintel could break. The further, uh, the wider apart your posts get, uh, the more brittle this is and the more likely it is to uh, collapse. They then move on to what's known as the corbelled arch, where you, you know, just kind of bring the registers of stone in a little closer until eventually you can close it off. It works, and we've seen a lot of corbelled domes and corbelled arches up to this point, but it's not terribly strong. But the true arch is very different. The true arch, first of all, has to be constructed a completely different way. You can't just keep stacking up stones. You actually need something called centering. That is, you need a support while you're building the arch. And the arch is made up of angled stones called vosures, and vosures um, are 
really, they do not provide any support until you lock them in with a final stone called a keystone. But once you do that, this arch becomes remarkably strong, much stronger than post and lintel, much, much stronger than a corbelled arch. And you can remove the centering and it's freestanding. It'll support its own weight, but it'll also support a lot more weight because it directs the forces to the side and down. On a lintel, uh, the forces are still pretty much straight down. On a corbelled arch, the forces are straight down. Uh, but on an arch, they are directed to the side, to the buttresses of the arch. They're directed to the side and down, which makes it much, much stronger. The other feature of the arch, of course, is that the arch is so incredibly versatile. If you take the arch and stretch it along um, the longitudinal axis, you actually get what's called a barrel vault or a tunnel. And a barrel vault is a great way to cover a very large space. In fact, if we look back at this arch at Perugia, you can see that it's actually a kind of a short barrel vault, a very strong, uh, very versatile structure. But if you take an arch and you intersect two barrel vaults with each other, you get what's known as a groin vault uh, or a cross vault. And this opens up space even more. If you take an arch and you spin it on its central axis, the vault that's created is a dome. And so the Etruscans are some of the first to make extensive use of arches and vaults. They're not the first. You can actually find arches going all the way back uh, to the Babylonian period. Uh, there's a mud brick arch in northern Israel, for example, that dates back to the Babylonian period. It's remarkable. So people knew about arches. They just didn't use them. So the Etruscans are some of the first to use arches, and they introduced the arch to the Romans, and it is the Romans who will really take the arch and just run with it and make it something spectacular. Towards the end of the Etruscan period, um, we'll talk a little bit more about the Etruscans in the late period, but they start to uh, be more strongly influenced by the Greeks. This is another one of their tombs. This is a tomb, again, carved out of tufa, and this is a tomb known as the Tomb of the Reliefs because it has all of these reliefs on it. Uh, these are carved into the tufa but covered in a thin layer of stucco so they can be painted. The, again, the idea here is you need the deceased to have everything that they have in this life, so you provide them with tools, with weapons, with shields, with armor. You can see there are greaves and helmets and swords and shields up on the walls, even axes and everyday objects. So these are things that you would provide for the deceased into the afterlife. On the back wall, you see a series of benches, and these are even articulated as if they are dining couches. Notice the pillows, <laughs> the pillows are there. Uh, notice we also have fans, staffs, all the things you could use. Here's a sword and a helmet hanging on the wall. Notice that the columns have these volutes. We'll talk a little bit about those. These are aeolic capitals. Um, and so we see that they would, you know, arrange the dead on these couches almost as if they were, again, dining at a banquet. But we see some pretty startling imagery here that we haven't seen before. And that imagery is found underneath one of these dining couches. And there's a couple characters that you might recognize. Uh, the first is a character that's been identified as Typhon or Typhoon, and he is one of these monstrous snake-legged giants. Uh, and he is seen as a character of the underworld, and he is in Tartarus. Now Tartarus is in Hades, and Hades is a Greek concept of the afterlife. That's the underworld in the Greek myth. And then that probably, you know, indicates who this character is here. This is a three-headed dog. This is, of course, Fluffy uh, from uh, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. No, of course, no. This is this is Cerberus, or Kerberos, as he's probably known in the Greek. And he's the three-headed dog, and he is the dog that guards the way into the underworld in Hades. These are not native Etruscan ideas. These are ideas that are definitely coming from the Greeks. So it shows that as the Etruscans wane in influence, they're borrowing more and more from the Greeks. And we see them take on more and more ideas. So we see how influential and important the Greeks are and how wide-ranging and extensive Greek influence is. Remember, this is Italy, but 
down in the boot of Italy, down in the toe and uh, in the football that the toe is kicking, uh, we have Greeks. That's called Magna Gratia. So we have Greeks. It's not like they even have to go to a different island or a different part of the Mediterranean. They're on the same peninsula. And so they can get this influence. And it seems that the Greeks, as they enter into this classical period, the Greek influence, Greek culture, even Greek belief systems uh, come to predominate, you know, predominate on the uh, Italian peninsula. Okay, well, next time we meet, we will talk about high classical Athens and the Acropolis and the Parthenon. Look forward to seeing you then. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.